Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, and we are on day 2144 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. Today we continue our extended series of messages that I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over the past couple of years. This message is week 12 of a 43-week series of the good news according to John the Apostle. John has a unique style and narrative as we walk with him through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. I do appreciate everybody being here again today as we continue our series on the good news according to the John the Apostle. Now, three weeks ago, we looked at a picture of legalism and how the Pharisees and religious leaders started to look for ways to kill Jesus. Their reasons were that he healed on the Sabbath. He performed many miracles in addition to that. He claimed to be equal with God, and the people were beginning to follow him instead of the religious leaders. Since they brought up the subject, Jesus was compelled to support the claims of being equal with God. And today's passage is John chapter 5, verses 19 through 30. It's located on pages 1655 and 1656 in your pew Bible. But I'm going to back up to verse 16 to our last lesson and, and include that in order to give the passage context. So follow along as I read. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they all tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he even was calling God his own father, making him equal with God. And on to verse 19, Jesus gave them this answer, Very truly I tell you, The son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to those whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life, and will not be judged but crossed over from death to life. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear... Will live, and those who hear will live. For, those, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this. For a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear the voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Let me start out with a real short story this morning. A distinguished-looking gentleman was behind the microphone to rally his people in the name of Allah. He praised Jesus as a genuine prophet, a wise teacher, a worthy example of human goodness. However, he declared with remarkable confidence that this same Jesus never claimed to be anything more than a mere man, and he never claimed to be God. And while that is true that we don't have recorded in the scripture the exact phrase where Jesus says, I am God, Jesus boldly asserted his deity in such precise and unambiguous terms that his enemies became outraged at him. They called him a blasphemer for making himself equal with God in verse 18, The magnitude of Jesus' many claims have eluded, may have eluded this Muslim leader, but his enemies understood his meaning completely. When Jesus was at the Pool of Bethesda, if you remember four weeks ago, where he healed this superstitious crippled man, he knew that would attract the attention of the religious authorities, 
And sure enough, after scolding that poor man for carrying his mat on the Sabbath, he, they hunted down Jesus and denounced him for violating their rules. Their purpose was to eliminate a threat to their authority. However, they masked the true intent of pretending to uphold God's preeminence of the Sabbath. Jesus didn't avoid this surface issue. He first correctly corrected their faulty theology, and then he addressed the real question at hand, who owns the Sabbath? Even fairly early in Jesus' ministry, the religious leaders attempted to be judge, jury, and executioner as they hold on yet another mock trial. And today's message would be a perfect setting for law and order. Jewish Temple Edition. Let's see if I can get this done right. In the criminal justice system, the people are represented by two separate yet equally important groups, the police who investigate crime and the district attorneys who prosecute the offenders. These are their stories. In the, criminal In the Jewish Temple criminal justice system, the people who are represented by two similar yet equally important groups, the Pharisees who investigated the crimes and the Sadducees who prosecute the offenders. These are their stories. And today, we're in the courtroom scene. Order in the court. Order in the court. And I'm appointing each one of you as part of the jury today to decide if what we consider today, those claims of Christ, are valid. Jesus had been accused of one of the most heinous crimes. Not only is he breaking the Sabbath, he is making himself equal with God. Let me set the courtroom scene for you. Jesus is not only accused, but he's acting as his own defense attorney. This week, Jesus presents six arguments, six claims of why he is the Lord, not only the Lord of the Sabbath, but he is indeed equal with God. Next week, we'll continue this trial. We won't finish it this week as he brings five character witnesses to argue on his behalf to support the claims that we'll see today. Jesus answered the question, who owns the Sabbath? With six specific claims, and I put these in the bulletin insert today, there's six claims of Christ, and I've included each of the claims and the verses in today's passage that correspond with those claims. Let me read through those, and then we'll dig into each one. First of all, he is equal with God, verses 19 and 20. Second, he is the giver of life. Third, he is the final judge, verses 22 and 23. Fourth, he will determine the eternal destiny of all humanity, verse 24. Fifth, he will raise the dead, verses 25 through 29. And sixth, he is always doing the will of God. Verse 30. So let's back up. The number one, Jesus claims that he is equal with God in verses 19 and 20. When Jesus said, my father is always working and so am I in verse 17, the religious leaders understood exactly what he meant. Because in verse 18 it says, the Jew so the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him. For he not only broke the Sabbath, he called God his Father, thereby making himself equal with God. The speech that follows today presents the truth of his deity in terms that no one of that day could mistake. Jesus begins in verse 19 with a double amen. It's a double emphasis in the Greek. It says, verily I tr verily, or truly I say to you, or it actually means, it is true, it is true. He then claimed equality with God, calling himself the Son of God and referring to God as his Father. And while the Father and the Son are distinct persons, the Father and Son are equal and unified. As such, the Father and the Son cannot act in opposition to one another. It's impossible. The Son is the perfect revelation of the Father here on earth in human form. And we're told in John chapter 1, verse 14, so the word became human and made his home among us. 
and therefore everything he does, reflects the intentions and actions of the Father. Moreover, what the Father knows, the Son knows, because they are one being. Therefore, they share the same mind. The second claim of Christ this morning is that he is the giver of life, verses 21 and 26. And in order to be able to give life, you must be the source of life. In John chapter 1, verse 4, it says, The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. Now, this would be an outrageous claim of any mere human. Now, doctors can provide medicine and administer treatments in order to delay death, but they cannot give life to a dead body. The prophets in the Old Testament were humans, and were used as instruments of a divine power when they raised people from the dead, but none of them dared to take the claim or credit for those rising from the dead. Only God can create something out of nothing, and then he fills that nothing with life. We are never more hopeless than when a loved one is near death or has died. Paul and I went to visit her mom yesterday, and it's just, we feel helpless on what to do next. There's just nothing we can do. If one loved one is only sick, we can bring them medicine. If our loved one is weary, we can offer them rest. If our loved one is discouraged, we can provide encouragement and consolation. If our loved one is destitute, we can provide some financial support for them. But what happens when they die? All we can do is mourn that loss. Only God has the power to restore life. The third claim that Jesus has this morning is that he is the final judge. Verses 22 and 23. Ask anyone, who is the final judge of man? And seldom will you ever receive an answer of anything other than God. Because only God can discern his heart's intention because he is omniscient. That means he knows everything. Only he can weigh the value of a person without being hypocritical because he is perfectly righteous. Only he can face the, have the fate of humanity because he made us and he is sovereign. The Father has delegated all judgment to the Son. It tells us in today's passage. Because the Son is equal with the Father. Consequently, Jesus claimed to deserve the same honor that was due to the Father. The fourth claim of Christ is a he determines the eternal destiny of all humanity in verse 24. Now, Jesus again punctuated his statement with a double amen. Very truly, it is true, it is true. And usually Jesus called for belief on him, in himself. In this case, he called for belief in the Father to reinforcement, reinforce the theme and com, the, the complete unity between the Father and the Son. To believe in one is to believe in the other, because the two persons are one. God the Father, God the Son. They are one. Furthermore, the belief impacts one's eternal destiny. As John wrote in chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God, one and only son. The fifth claim that Jesus brings before the court today is that he will raise the dead. Again, it's a double amen. Very truly, it is true, it is true. And he emphasizes the immediate statement in which Jesus claims to be the one who will summon the dead for that day of judgment. His phrasing in verse 25 is interesting because it's a verb for here, but it has a double meaning. The dead, that means all humanity who has died from the beginning of time, will hear the voice of the Son of God. But only those who hear through believing loyalty, will actually receive life. The first hearing is a literal one. That is, mere exposure to the sound of voice when he calls all the dead up at the judgment day. The second one is to comprehending the message 
And not only comprehending the message, understanding that Jesus Christ is equal with God, the Son of God, also believing that message. And the irony, of course, in this case is that dead people cannot hear anything, but his statement has both a present and a future aspect in it. He will summon the dead to judgment on that final day. However, the dead, those who have not died yet, still have the opportunity because after death, you don't have the choice anymore to receive life or to reject life. We only have that choice before we die. As Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, for God says, at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Now, Jesus validated his qualification to judge all of humanity because he was both the Son of God who could give life and the Son of Man who experienced life as a human. The Word became flesh, became human. And yet he did it without sin. So he's the only perfect one that has the ability to judge others. In describing the fate of humankind, Jesus explained two possible destinies. You can have life, which leads to eternal life, or you can have death or judgment, which leads to eternal death. Taken by itself, the statement would appear to declare that our fate is determined by our deeds, and it determines our eternal destiny. That is to say that evil deeds lead to judgment or eternal death, while good deeds lead to life, eternal life. Therefore, though, although we know that our good deeds do not save us, our lives will reflect our good deeds, will reflect good deeds if we are saved. I refer to this as believing loyalty. We have a choice. We can believe, and if we do believe, then we should be loyal to Jesus Christ through his word. If we choose not to believe, that's our choice. We're choosing eternal death. It is true on the basis of judging will, of judging will one's behavior will determine whether they're good or evil, but the ultimate test will be, did they believe or did they reject? And this is what Christ is getting across here as he's before this courtroom today. It is true that the Greek term for judgment in verse 24 and 29 is chrysis, and it's a noun form of the verb for krino. It means to judge, to divide, to assess, and decide. Those are all our choices. And theoretically, a person could stand before God, before the judge, and gain eternal life if they were found to be morally perfect. But however, in the practical sense of it all, no one is morally perfect. Therefore, to face judgment without grace is to face condemnation. Consequently, Jesus uses two ideas interchangeably. Judgment is condemnation, and that's the point for us to avoid that judgment altogether. And by grace is received through belief. In verse 24, let me read that to you. This is that double amen. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes, him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged because they have passed over from death unto life. It takes our choice. We're not saved by our good deeds, but we are saved based on whether we have made that choice to accept Christ. And the sixth and final claim that Jesus brings before the court today is that he is always doing the will of God. In verse 30, Jesus' final claim links his action on earth to the will of the Father in heaven. As we say in our, our Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Everything the Son does reflects the interaction of the Father because they are one being. Note the sudden shift in the perspective, though, in verse 30. 
By my, and I'll read verse 30. By myself, he changes from the third person to the first person. He says, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear. My judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but to please him who sent me. And throughout this claim, his claims before this, Jesus did refer to himself as either the Son of God or the Son of Man, and the third person. And he transitions. This is a transition verse between this lesson this week and our lesson next week, where he changes from the third person to the first person witness. And he brings in those five character witnesses in chapter 5, verses 31 through 47. But here he restates his original claim in uh, verse 19. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. So he lists it in the first person at the beginning of his argument and at the end of his claims today. His point is clear. He's not referring to another person. He's referring to himself as equal with God. Stop for a moment, though, as the jury, and seriously consider these six claims. Think of them, or think of the best person in all of history, except for Jesus Christ, either living or dead, and imagine them standing before you today and making this speech, having six points. But they say, I am equal with God the Father. I am the giver of life. I am the final judge over all humanity. I hold the destinies of every human in my hand. I will raise the dead. Everything I do is the will of God. Now, if someone stood before you today and made that proclamation, how would you respond? Because all of, the, all of, the, of all the great philosophers, teachers, artists, and politicians who ever lived, none could make such great claims unless they were completely insane or they were shamelessly evil. Not unless that person is God in human flesh. He's the only one that can make these six claims today. So what's the application to our own lives? Jesus' declaration demands a response. Jesus declared six truths about himself in this passage today, pointing to a single and overarching declaration that demands a response from us. Jesus claims equality with God, leaving humanity no room for compromise and no middle ground to stand upon. We must choose either to believe or to reject his declaration. And since we are in the courtroom today, let me bring some additional evidence or additional chart here. Now, I have a, some computer programming knowledge and background, and computer programs are based on logic. It's usually based on an if-then scenario. If you do this, then this will happen. And this is what we have before us today. The decision tree, as it's called, and you are at the top, If he deliberately misrepresented himself and you say, I don't believe Jesus was deity. I reject that claim that he was deity. I don't think that he was divine, the son of God. Then that leads it to two possibilities. If he deliberately misrepresented himself and he was the liar of a worse kind, on the other hand, if he truly believed that he was the Son of God, and he wasn't, then they've completely lost their, he's completely lost his mind, and he was utterly insane. And this is where many of the Pharisees and religious leaders ended up. They say he is possessed by a demon. He's out of his mind. He's a lunatic. So they've made this decision tree to reject Christ as a deity because he's a lunatic. And some say he's a liar just like the devil is. Therefore, if Jesus is wrong about his identity, he's neither a good man nor a teacher worth learning from. Therefore, none of his words would be trustworthy and we can throw out the entire Bible. But if you claim that he is deity, he was the Son of God, then you have two choices at that point. 
You can choose either rebellion or to trust him. Accepting the fact of Jesus' divine divinity without trusting in salvation puts you in no better position than what the demons are. In James chapter 2, verse 19, it says, You have faith, for you say you believe there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. It is possible to believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that he came to earth as the Son of God in human form, and still rebel against him and reject him. That is a choice that we must make. We reject the offer of grace, and if we do, we suffer the penalty of sin. But how is it possible for a person to do that in their right mind? Well, it's by trusting the false claims of religion instead of receiving God's gift of grace. Religion is nothing more than an attempt for humanity to gain entrance into heaven on their own terms and their own merits, primarily by achieving enough goodness through their own efforts. Sadly, the road to hell is jammed with people who proudly trust their own merit rather than humbly admitting their moral poverty and receiving that eternal gift of life. If you remember back last year when we did the Sermon on the Mount series, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and the gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. The other response is to trust Jesus as God's son, equal with God, yet came to earth in human form to pay the penalty for our sins, to accept the claims of Christ Jesus as true, to place complete trust in him, receiving that gift of eternal life through believing loyalty. To me, this is the only alternative that makes sense. To believe that Christ is the Son of God, he died for our sins, and trusting him for our salvation. And this is what Jesus Christ proclaimed before those religious leaders that day. He owns the Sabbath, and he is equal with God. And he brought forth these six claims to prove the fact that what he says is true. As I mentioned in the beginning, next Sunday we'll continue with the trial. As Jesus brings into the courtroom for us to hear witnesses that back up and prove his claims that he presented today. So next week we'll look at the five witnesses for the defense. So I'd ask you to please read John chapter 5, verses 31 through 47 in preparation for next week's message. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this time where we can get a glimpse of Jesus Christ as he presents his arguments, his claims before these religious leaders who thought they knew all about you. His claims impact our lives, Father. And ultimately, we must decide is Jesus Christ truly your son? Is he equal with you? Or is he just a lunatic or a liar? And once we decide that he is your son, it's our choice, Father, to believe or rebel, to trust or rebel. Give us a heart today to trust in him. And we know once we trust in you, Father, that Trust is secured for all eternity. We pass from death to life. We thank you for the ability to do this, Father. We thank you for the salvation you've granted us today. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's Word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly... I am your friend, as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, 
learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.